Hmm. Interesting. Welcome back. <clears throat> Scott Cole here in uh, Astro Playground, part of Stillwater Studio. Wanted to uh, uh, welcome back our, our viewers, our return viewers. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, some of the um, technical aspects of uh, what we're doing. Um, the, the, more specifically, uh, the hardware environments uh, that we're going to be building. And now, uh, the last time, our uh, last video, uh, I had uh, introduced you folks to uh, this rig uh, that is to my left. And it is uh, fully assembled and ready to go. Um, it is, of course, much easier to manipulate and much lighter. Uh, it doesn't require any kind of cart or anything. Um, I can basically pick the rig right up, even with the camera on it, even though I take the camera off to move it. Um, I can pick the rig right up, move it around, no problem at all. Uh, that is not the case uh, with this rig. Um, the, and this, of course, is just the, uh, the tripod base for this rig. Um, but it is uh, uh, important to note that um, a, a rig like this, especially a uh, uh, an observatory class uh, rig like this is it's imperative it's it, it is critical that the base be uh, as solid and unshakable as possible um, that being said the uh, the the heart if you will of um, any kind of big rig like this has got to be the uh, the tripod legs um, and the, of course the mount. Uh, the mount is <laughs> well. Let's just put it this way: without the, without a good quality mount, it doesn't matter how good your optics are. Um, if your mount is shoddy, if it's if it uh, doesn't track well, if it has shutter in it, um, if it's uh, not stable, um, if it's not made well, uh, your mount is um, is going to determine the quality of your images. Um, it, it's, it's just like in, in building a home. It doesn't matter what color the paint is on the walls or how fancy the kitchen cabinets are or whether or not you've got a jacuzzi tub in your master bath. If your foundation is shoddy, <laughs> it makes no difference what color the drapes are. So um, the, the, the foundation is everything in homes and especially in rigs like this. Um, I, I am constantly amazed at watching some of these photographers out there and I, I won't name names um, but I encourage people that are into either terrestrial or celestial photography make doubly sure you're not skimping out on your uh, your support systems your tripods um, tripods are are vitally vitally important I have a couple of uh, I've, I've had several tripods over the years um, some of my favorite landscape tripods are made by Gitzo. Um, they're not cheap, um, but they are rock solid. Uh, they're just dead on rock solid. My, my big uh, Gitzo tripod will hold that, that camera and lens combination easily. It will hold that and it'll hold a 600 millimeter lens on there um, with no problem whatsoever and, and just rock solid. I, I can't tell you how many times I have seen photographers um, go out and uh, they're taking pictures and they're shooting on a, a 30 or 40 dollar tripod you know from uh, one of the box stores uh, you know they, they and I, I had one guy just as a quick story I had one guy here locally that um, he had uh, a, a very nice camera a nice lens probably several thousand dollars uh, worth of camera and lens combination and it was sitting on a substandard tripod um, and the it, it it went over and it, it broke the lens um, it, it cracked it uh, fortunately it didn't do too much damage but that kind of thing just makes my heart sick you know especially when you're talking about camera systems that are several thousand dollars a lot of my lenses cost more than my bodies so um, it's vitally important that you have a good tripod that being said Celestron has gone above and beyond when it comes to their CGXL mount uh, and tripod setup. This thing 
is an absolute tank. I, I, it, it, I, it would easily support hundreds and hundreds of pounds, hundreds, it, probably more than that. I have, I have sat on this uh, myself, and I'm, you know, I, I run about 240, 6'6 six, six at 240. I have sat on this, and it, it just is rock solid. Uh, this thing is, is the base, it's the heart of, of this system, and if it's set up correctly, it's not going to move. Um, the mount that goes on top of it, the CGX mount, C I'm, excuse me, the CGXL mount um, is bolted into this heavy cast iron uh, base and it's secured uh, quite well. Um, there's no, no problem at all with that. It, it, uh, uh, it will not move. Um, and just to illustrate the importance of why something like this is so important, um, the, the stability of your mount and we'll get into this a little bit more in detail, but on the mount itself, there are these um, uh, adjustment knobs for adjusting your, uh, your right and left possession, uh, position um, for uh, bringing in um, the, uh, the North Star, right, and polar aligning. And I have, uh, and on the mount, there are uh, locking screws for the um, for the, uh, the deck, the declination, um, uh, the, the ascension, basically, how the, how the, the telescope angles itself up. Um, and you can lock those in. I can affect my polar alignment just by loosening one of the locking knobs ever so slightly. It will move those, um, uh, the, the alignment out just a few arc seconds. Um, uh, tenths of a second, right, of an arc second. Um, it, it, that's just, and it's just the tension. It's not even so much moving, it's just the tension within the mount itself, you know. So there's a delicate ballet that's in, that's in play here. Um, it, it is vitally important that a mount like this be rock solid because you breathe on it and it, it will you know, shudder. That's why you, you don't image in high winds. You don't image in even mild winds. Um, very low winds at most. Um, especially with, a, with an OTA the size of a 14. It's a sail. So, um, but at any rate, the, the, the mount is of vital importance. Right? Uh, the, the tripod and mount combination are of vital importance. Celestron has gone a long way in um, developing a, uh, a mount to support this uh, OTA and all of the, uh, the peripherals that go with it um, that, that sit up on there. It, it, they have done a great job. This is, it's a, a fantastic tripod. Can't say enough about it. Very beefy, very, I mean, the legs are just monstrous. The biggest tripod I've ever seen, um, you know, for uh, as far as like a mobile tripod. Um, I, I, it's, it weighs a ton. It's very, very heavy. You put the mount on here and it challenges me to move it. Um, you know, just the mount and the, uh, uh, the, the tripod. No weights, no nothing. Just the mount and the tripod. It's very heavy. Um, which is a good thing because it won't move. Um, and that's what you really want. You want it to be rock solid. So, that being said, gotta have my coffee. Mm. That being said, um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the setup um, and what is involved in getting the, the mount um, up on here, getting it locked in place, um, and then uh, you know, putting your, your OTA on and attaching your different peripherals. Uh, we're going to do that um, you know, throughout the video here, uh, and we'll start with the, with the mount. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll uh, have the, uh, some, some nice tight shots of this. Uh, as we're as we're building and we'll go from there Now I've found that um, Over the years I've had several different kinds of cases uh, to uh, store our equipment and Hands down the very best uh, that I've ever come across are made by Pelican um, They have been on airplanes with me. They have been all over the world um, and uh, they are just tough as nails. Uh, waterproof, watertight. You throw in some desiccant uh, uh, pads in there, and it, it just, it's just a fantastic environment. Um, this big Pelican case that I have here, I've used in the past for photography equipment. However, 
it fits the, uh, the mount for the CGXL quite well, as you can see. The, um, the styrofoam that came, it came shipped in uh, fits in this box in this Pelican case perfectly. And you can take that mount and slip it right in there. Uh, the, the three holes at the, the top there are actual the actual weights, as you can see. Um, the, and those weights are, I, I believe, are coming in at 22 pounds each. And there's three of them, and you need all three of them for this setup. So, um, but an absolutely wonderful way to transport this mount um, through this Pelican case. You certainly don't need something as fancy as the Pelican case. You can just keep the cardboard box uh, that the mount comes in. As a matter of fact, they encourage you to do that uh, and keep the styrofoam packing. Um, in my case, this just absolutely it fit the bill and it was perfect. One of the things that um, you should always do, it's always good advice, um, is to, when you first get a, uh, a mount like this, they're obviously going to come with a set of instructions. Um, fortunately, uh, they're not terribly difficult to understand. Um, for, you know, most people, this, this will be a, a fairly straightforward, um, you know, read. Uh, but it is it is very important to review the instructions that come with from the manufacturer uh, as to proper setup procedures and so on and so forth, um, and, and you know to also to uh, uh, familiarize yourself with the uh, the workings of the mount. All right. So um, as we uh, as we get into um, you know the the uh, actual assembly of that, which we're going to do here in just a second, um, we're I'm going to encourage you to always refer back to uh, your manufacturer's um, manual on this, both for the mount and for the OTA. Uh, and I believe it also, on mounts like this, it comes with an instruction manual for the handset. Um, it, you know, the handset is, a, is an important part of the, uh, the, the system here. If you are uh, not running, you know, a uh, a full system like Sequence Generator Pro or um, Sharp Cap or something like that uh, for polar aligning and such. The handset is is very important. However, if you do have uh, a computer and your your uh, most of these things are going to require uh, some sort of uh, computer to aid them to uh, you know in in their operation, uh, the, the those programs can allow you to take the handset right out of the loop. <laughs> You don't even need to uh, w worry yourself about the about the handset. However, it is a good idea to familiarize yourself with the owner's manual and the use of the handset in case you do need to use it. So, um, but at any rate, excellent excellent resource. Uh, so, with the uh, the mount, uh, so what we'll do is is we'll go ahead and take the mount out of its styrofoam case and we're going to set it up on here. Um, the uh, the bolts that are uh, a part of this are very heavy duty um, kind of hard to kind of hard to see but they are uh, um, a very uh, heavy steel um, uh, coarse thread eight millimeter cap um, screw type bolt it has a nylon washer on it a metal washer on top of that uh, and these will hold the uh, the mount to the tripod quite efficiently. So we'll, we'll just set those there for now and we'll go ahead and pull the CGXL mount out. Um, and the mount itself has handles on it that make it relatively simple to handle. So this mount, as you can see, has two handles. There's a handle up top and one down below. And underneath here is the Allen wrench that I was, I had mentioned, the storage for that Allen wrench. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to have a, to have an extra, to have a spare. Um, but this is, you know, there for when you need it. And we will be using it right now. So um, as we set this in place, um, and 
you know, this, this mount is easily a one-person lift, um, unless you're a very small person uh, or don't have a, a significant amount of, of uh, strength, um, you should be able to move this mount relatively easily uh, by yourself. I think it only weighs about maybe 45 pounds, 40 pounds, something like that. Um, I don't have the exact specs <laughs> committed to memory, but it's not that heavy. It's not terribly heavy. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put this on. Now, the, uh, the front of the mount is here. That, and the, the, uh, the way to, to note that is the, the cap that's on the end here. It's always pointing to the front leg pointing north. Right? So we will turn this around and we'll set it right onto the mount the tripod, excuse me. And it is a little bit of a, a fit, but it should slide down in there. Just like that. Pretty much all there is to it. All right. And then we'll take our bolts and the bolts simply line up thread in place and you're good to go. Just like that. And there's only three of these, but their sheer size is um, indicative of the stability of this mount. These bolts are very large. And that's pretty much all there is to it. One of the things that you'll want to make sure that you do is tighten these down. Um, but I would also encourage you not to go crazy with the, uh, the tightening on them. They only need to be snug. They don't need to be overly, overly tight. Um, you, you know, that's a good practice overall is to make sure that your uh, bolts are not excessively, excessively tight. But you do want them snug. And again, the Allen wrench will store up in that handle. It can be a, a little interesting trying to get it up in there. Um, but it does, it does store up in there relatively nicely. So um, that is the, uh, the mount uh, in place. Um, and we'll uh, let you have a closer look at it. Okay, so here's a close-up of the CGXL. It's a very beefy setup. As you can see, the bolts and that will allow us to have a solid base to work from. Okay, so there's a couple things that we need to do first. Um, one of the big things is to install the counterweight uh, shaft. Um, and when you're in dark sky locations, uh, it's important that people know that there's a, a telescope uh, in their midst, and that's why I have um, the legs wrapped in rope light. I have the counterweight shaft uh, wrapped or a, with a, uh, a, an LED, a red LED, um, and that will, at least I hope, 
uh, alert people to the uh, presence of the telescope. Now this shaft um, is a solid steel brushed nickel uh, shaft. It's, it's made quite well, um, but it has to thread up into the body of the CGXL and it's got a long thread on it. Go ahead and thread that in like so. And then our, this is affectionately referred to as the toe buster. Uh, the, uh, it is, if you don't have it installed uh, and you accidentally loosen one of those weights and it falls off of that shaft, <laughs> Uh, a lot of times your feet are right underneath it and believe me when I tell you you don't want a 22 pound weight coming you know two and a half three feet off of this down onto your toe because you'll be going to the hospital that will not be fun so make sure that um, your toe buster is installed once you get your weights installed so from there what we're going to do is now uh, the last thing uh, in the case here well second to last thing the azimuth adjustments. These uh, go into the mount as so on both the right and left side and you simply just tighten them up until they make contact and that's where you stop. You don't want to to go any further than that just until they're just until they make contact and stop. And then from here what we'll do is we'll adjust our telescope, the, uh, the mount, um, down, uh, which is a uh, clockwise direction on your uh, altitude knob. And we'll take this down to approximately, um, you can see over here, there's uh, the altitude adjustment knob. And the where I am in the, uh, um, in the, the the northern hemisphere is at about 43 to 44 degrees of elevation. So on, the, on all of these uh, go-to mounts, they have an elevation gauge and a mark. And what we'll do is we'll just take that down to where, to where the, uh, it reads at about 40, 43, 44, like that. That's close enough. So that is about right, about right there. And then from here, we'll lock, these are the altitude adjustment locking knobs. There's one on the left and one on the right. We'll just snug those up and then we'll install our weights. And as I said, these weights are very large and very heavy and you really do not want that falling on your toe that would be very bad so we'll slide this up in place lock it down grab the next one slide it up into place Lock it down, grab the third one. This is a total of 66 pounds of weight. And you always want to make sure, as I said about the toe buster, want to make sure that that's installed. That will prevent the weights from slipping off the shaft, which is a very, very bad thing. Just lock that in place now. The other thing to note is that before you ever install an OTA onto the top deck of, the, of a system like this, you always want to make sure your weights are installed first. Uh, the OTA is very heavy, and if there is not a counterweight balance in place, it doesn't have to be balanced, but it has to be there to prevent the scope from crashing to one side or to the other um, if, when, if and when you, you loosen the clutch for uh, the for the um, the declination, it, it would without the weight there, it would go crashing to one side or the other. It's a very bad thing. Always install your weights first. Okay.
Okay, so our next step is to get the OTA uh, out of its uh, travel case and get it set up on the mount. Um, and uh, we right now have it uh, stripped down to its bare bones um, and uh, we'll go from there. So uh, case, a case like this, especially if you're going to be traveling with the unit, uh, is highly recommended. Um, they have uh, hard cases as well uh, for setups like this, but this soft case uh, is made very, very well. It's got a very tight um, closed cell foam um, construction and uh, it's, it's protecting the OTA very well. So uh, Nathan is going to be helping me with um, getting the, uh, the bag out of the way once I lift this scope out. Um, and we'll need the, uh, the mat, the black mat. You can set that right there. Turn it over. Okay, grab the, grab the towel, the red towel. Set it on top of that mat. <clears throat> yeah, just get down. It, it's, it's okay. Here. There we go. Okay. All right, and so we'll just lift this out and set it on. Nathan will move the uh, case as soon as I get it up uh, and out of the bag. All right, here we go. Okay. So the OTA is the OTA. Yeah, Nathan. Nathan said it. It's what, honey? It's big. It's big. It's big. That's right. <laughs> so um, the OTA itself, the bottom of the OTA is is down here. I've actually uh, opted to put uh, two of these bars. Uh, the Lasmandi um, uh, dovetail bars on the scope. Uh, it came with the one on the bottom, obviously. This is a, an extra one that I chose to, to utilize so that I could attach all of my peripherals and such directly to the top bar. So um, the things that I leave on the scope um, when it goes into the bag are the, uh, the, the ZWO focuser, the, um, because it's, it's basically connected hard to the scope, uh, the autofocuser, uh, and also the reducer. I leave the reducer in place um, because it, it basically it's at the very close to the same level as the, uh, uh, as the, the autofocuser, and they both fit uh, in that bag quite well, covered and zipped. So no problem at all. Um, so what we'll do now is go ahead and lift this up in place, set it on the plate, and tighten it down. And as you'll see, um, I'll do it. As you'll see, the, um, uh, the, the manipulation of this is not terrible. So here we go. that clamp our double check and make sure that's all there is to it it is don't get me wrong it is a little heavy but it's not it's not prohibitive um, certainly you know it's a little bit of preparation, you'd be able to take a scope like this into the field. Um, not a problem at all. Now, one of the things <clears throat> that I have done is to mark on my uh, bottom plate um, with a Sharpie the position um, that I've, I've found balance for the, um, uh, for the declamation, um, which is in this position here. Okay, so um, I've gone ahead and thought ahead on that to get that into the right place. So what we'll do is we'll loosen these knobs just enough to get it to slide. Okay. 
and I've got one on the front and one on the back. And we'll get it. Right to the point where right there. Lock it down. Now this will not be this will not be in balance right now because we're still missing quite a few pieces. Um, however, it's much closer <laughs> than it was just a few minutes ago. So there are some more pieces that go on the back and up on the top. Uh, so we'll uh, take a look at that next. to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the what drives uh, the, the the big rig the, the telescope um, the uh, the Eagle 3 um, Pro here that you see represented here this is this is the main computer that drives everything on board um, it is a fully self-contained um, uh, Windows computer that will operate all aspects of the uh, of the onboard rig systems. Um, it has uh, various power supplies for all of your equipment. Um, we currently have two of these ports, two of the four ports that are available in operation. Uh, one for the um, uh, the main uh, camera and the other one for the focuser. Um, all of the other power supplies are coming from the USB 3s that you see here on this side of the scope, on the side, excuse me, on the side of the, uh, the, uh, the computer. Um, there are a myriad of uh, um, USB slots. Uh, there, are, there are six on this side, four here, two over here, and there are two others that are over here. There's also an HDMI port and a data port if you need it. Uh, the RCA ports here are power supplies for the uh, dew heaters um, and all of that is operated through this system including the ECHO which is the um, the temperature sensor for uh, what is current ambient um, and the dew point uh, so it picks up all of that sends that to the Eagle uh, and that then um, uh, adjusts accordingly for uh, the the dew heater strips um, and and such. It's it's all automated. It, it works works really well. Um, one of the things that I like best about uh, this setup is that the cable management, <laughs> uh, even with all of the peripherals that are running on this, the cable management is really quite nice. It's quite easy, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, everything that you see. Uh, here, right here, basically controls all aspects of the telescope. Um, and it sends it wirelessly um, through uh, up to my wireless access point that I have outside uh, and right into my home network. I mentioned that in my last video. Um, but it also uh, gives you the opportunity to uh, control the scope uh, point to point um, so that you can uh, send the wireless signal directly to a device if you're like out in the field you don't have a, a wireless access point or a network um, you can send it directly to a device um, which is nice uh, that's that's very nice uh, so you can you can control the scope um, you know from 
you know, inside your tent, <laughs> if you're out in the field, you know, and you're, you're on a summer's night um, and you're laying in your tent, you got the scope set up, um, you can control everything right from your iPad, um, which is, that's, that's very nice. It's, uh, you know, it works very well. My young son was uh, asking me about, you know, using the telescope optically, um, you know, for, for viewing with an eyepiece. And you, of course, can do that. Um, that's, that's, you know, it's set up to do that. As a matter of fact, the C14 came with a very nice uh, eyepiece um, and right angle, uh, you know, for, for doing that. However, a lot of the targets that are up there are so faint, so dim, that um, you, you can't really see them, you know, with an eyepiece. Um, now, planets, moon, you know, um, some of the larger objects, Orion, um, you know, uh, Andromeda, uh, and other objects, you can, uh, you can, you know, at least on a clear night, on a dark night, uh, you should be able to see them optically. Um, but nothing is going to compare to what you're going to get with a dedicated camera. Uh, it just, it, it just will not compare. So, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you a close-up view here of the, um, uh, this rig uh, here and uh, you can have a have a look Okay, uh, we're going to take and mount the main uh, drive rig for the, uh, the C14 up on uh, the Lasbandi uh, plate, uh, the dovetail plate. One of the things that I opted to do was to run, um, and it's probably a bit of overkill, but uh, I didn't want this rig to move at all. And so I, I purchased two of these Lasmandi uh, plates, uh, dovetail brackets, um, and mounted them on the, uh, the bottom of the eagle. And that will then sit on the, uh, the, the dovetail plate. And, I, and it, it, you can't really see it, but I have a mark um, here and a mark here for the uh, position of these, of these plates, which represents uh, the balance. Uh, on the scope, so so here we go. Take this, and set that on there like that. Yes, and we'll lock that down, or just get it snug and slide the the rig into its position. I should be able to push that up to get it into position. That looks good right there. I'll lock those down. And once those are locked down tight, that is not going to move. It is very, very tight and snug. Um, and as you can see, if I loosen the clutch for the uh, deck, if I can, probably can't see it all that well, but it is, it is mounted quite efficiently. So um, from here, we will go ahead and uh, set the scope up right. 
um, and then go ahead and get the back of the scope, the image train for the back of the scope installed. Uh, and we'll give you a look at the uh, position on the, um, the main computer the drive system right now. Okay, so now we're going to just uh, take care of some of the, um, the incidentals. Uh, there is a couple of guide scope um, options. Uh, there is the one that come with the, uh, the Celestron, uh, which is already installed on the back of the OTA, uh, this stock uh, spotting scope. But I have opted to purchase, uh, which wasn't terribly expensive, I think it was $35, uh, this Telrad um, spotting scope which is uh, really nice. It, uh, it has an illuminated rectile that you, you turn it on, it's battery powered, you turn it on and there is a, uh, up inside the scope, there is a, a bullseye, an illuminated rectile bullseye. Um, and so it's, it, it's a very popular kind of a spotting scope. Great for just putting Polaris in the center. So we'll just take that and set that up here in place and tighten it down. Uh, fairly simple. Uh, this is one of those things that's kind of a nice little extra added thing to have for your, you know, setup, initial setup. So back of the scope, uh, we have um, our 0.7 focal reducer. Uh, and this will take the image, um, the focal length uh, of the scope from its native uh, 3910, 3,009, uh, 3,910 millimeter down uh, at, oh, at, uh, F11, take it down to your uh, focal reduced range of 2737 at F7. Um, that's what this unit is here. So, and our back focus is achieved from this, from the plane of this, uh, the, the glass here, this plane right here uh, back to achieve our back focus. And there is a a specific back focus for this scope, which I believe is 147 millimeters, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that. I might be uh, might be off on that. I, have, I can get the specs on it. But I believe it's 147 millimeters. At any rate, um, so one of the things that we're going to do to achieve that is to attach uh, this unit, which is, this is just a T adapter from Celestron. Um, it just, it's just basically an aluminum tube. Uh, that that uh, gives you a, um, a setback. So we'll attach that directly to the scope. And again, things don't need to be excessively tight. They just need to be snug. Snug is all you need. Um, and then from there, we have uh, our off-axis guider. Um, and I like to keep things either in Ziploc bags or something else to keep the dust off of them, um, especially anything that's going to be in directly in the image train. Um, this, this unit here uh, has a tiny pickoff prism that you can see right here, um, and that pickoff prism will reach in and grab a little bit of the light that's coming through the main imaging scope. All right and it will then send that, that image up to this camera. And you will then be able to find a star in your field of view, uh, grab that star, lock onto that star with PhD, PhD 2 guiding, and, and stay locked on it. And it, it is a much more accurate way to guide uh, going through the main imaging scope instead of going through a, a, um, a guide scope like this, especially at those long focal lengths. Absolutely necessary um, to use something like this. You'd, it'd be, it would be a nightmare trying to guide with this scope at that focal length. <laughs> so a little bit of fiddling uh, with this to get it right. Um, you, have to, you have to adjust, there are, I don't know how well you can see that, but there are two, there are two uh, um, grub screws uh, that sit down in there and there is a, a secondary uh, thumb screw here and a secondary thumb screw here. Um, you want to loosen those two up and you adjust the stock. That's what this, that's what this, this unit is here, this stock. That, that whole thing will slide in and out. All right? And the, 
uh, the um, helix focuser will also slide on and off of that stock. So you want to move the, the prism as high in, into, up into this as you can to get it out of the field of view of the main camera, but enough in view so that it can grab that light. So there's a little bit of fiddling that's involved with this, um, but it's not difficult. It's not difficult. So uh, at any rate, this threads right onto here. And you want to be careful not to drop it. <laughs> it's an expensive piece of hardware, and you don't want to drop it. But thread that on. Just like that. Again, not terribly tight. Just snug. And then from here, we have our camera and filter drawer. Um, this is the... This here is the ZWO uh, two, um, ASI two, uh, 2600 Pro color, one shot color. We also have the, uh, the, the, the sister to this, which is the uh, 2600 mono. Um, and, uh, but this one here is the color. And it has already threaded onto it the filter drawer, as you can see. Uh, filter drawer and a two inch filter. Um, and you can uh, snap any filter in there you want. You can also just put a filter wheel on if you're, if you're so inclined. Um, I'm just using the filter drawer for, for the moment. Uh, but this, with the, the, three, the three prongs that you see there, uh, those three prongs will, will sit in line with these, uh, these, screw, these um, uh, thumb screws. So you just set that up in there like that, snug it up, you know, get it up in close, and then just very carefully adjust your thumb screws until you have friction. Now again, this does not need to be overly tight. It just needs to be snug so that things will not move. And that is, that's the, the image train. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and plug things in. So we have uh, all of our cables. And one of the other things that I want to mention is that as nice as the cameras and the guide cameras are, as nice as, uh, you got me in the focus, okay, as nice as the cameras are um, uh, and, and such, the cables that come with them are, they, they leave you wanting. I went ahead and purchased um, aftermarket cables from uh, um, Cable Matters and from, uh, there's another one from, uh, I can't remember, I can't remember the, the manufacturer, but it is, ah, StarTech, StarTech.com. These are, these come very highly rated, uh, they're excellent cables, they're shielded, uh, much heavier duty than what comes with the camera. Uh, do yourself a favor, um, do not stay with the cabling that comes with these cameras. Just change it out. Just go with the better cabling. So uh, the, there is the serial port for the USB and the 12 volt power uh, for the, these both go into the uh, focuser. So we'll snap the, the one into the focuser and the power into the focuser along with the, uh, the temperature sensor uh, for the focuser. Um, and then the focuser is, is already set up. So from here, we have uh, going out from here, there's uh, 12 volt power for the uh, for the camera, for the main imaging camera, and we'll just plug that in just like that. And then we also have from here, let me just grab these cables. Uh, we have a couple of cables. Uh, there is the first cable is this uh, USB 3, um, which supplies power but also data um, you also but you also want to have the dedicated 12 volt power for the fans for the cooling of this camera so we'll plug that in and then the last cable is a StarTech uh, USB-C that goes to the 174 mini for the off-axis guider um, and that there represents pretty much the setup as you see it now um, if I if I turn this down just a bit, you can see that I have uh, I have the uh, the echo plugged into the USB here, a uh, little little uh, mini. But I also have this serial uh, USB three to serial data 
coming from the uh, coming out of the eagle and all the way down onto the other side, plugging into the mount. Um, that's the, the the data connection for the mount. Um, so from there, that is pretty much. Yep, that's pretty much the the the, the data setup, the cabling setup. We do have a couple of dew heater strips. Uh, there is a dew heater strip here. I'll just rotate that again so you can see it a little better. There's a dew heater strip here uh, for the uh, the main imaging cam or for the um, the guide camera, but there's also a uh, a temperature sensor here that goes up underneath the the strip, and and it sends temperature data to the echo. All right, and when it hits a particular dew point, it kicks on and warms this up, which then warms the um, the shield up on the on this um, uh, scope and hence keeps the dew and the fog and anything else from collecting on the, uh, the main front element. Um, and that goes for this scope as well as the main OTA. Um, the OTA has uh, its own dedicated um, dew heater strip uh, that will go around this uh, and eventually we'll have a large aluminum dew shield that'll come out to about here come out to about here um, and that will protect the front element the front uh, corrector plate and so that's pretty much what we have as far as the, the setup um, and uh, we'll we'll go ahead and give you a, a closer view at this Okay, the last thing that uh, uh, we want to make sure that we do and do correctly is to get the scope balanced. Now, the, um, the deck balance, um, which is uh, this adjustment here, all right, is probably pretty close already. Um, it's, you know, I've got, I've got that, as you can see, it's fairly well, it's fairly well balanced. Um, because I have the, uh, the marks for all of my equipment in place, um, I, and I don't have anything extra as far as um, you know cabling and such. Uh, there's nothing that so I've already had that achieve that balance. However, the um, the balance for the um, the essential the uh, um, uh, the the right ascension um, is not set. Right, so if we loosen the clutch on that and bring that back, um, if I as I move down, you see it wants to fall on its own, right? So that the, the it is right now scope heavy, as you can see, it wants to fall. So what we need to do is is adjust our uh, our balance uh, with our weights here. Uh, that is relatively easily achieved. Um, so we just go ahead and lock our clutch, and we want to slide these weights down very carefully and as you can see the importance of having your toe buster in place uh, because if that that thing fell it would be bad it would be really bad and not to mention these weights are not cheap all right you don't so you don't want to damage them um, so we'll put this down to about close to the bottom move this one down um, a little bit and move this one down just a little bit all right and now we'll check our balance again you can see it still wants to fall. It's still heavy. So we'll go ahead and adjust again, taking our balance, our, our weights down. I'll probably bottom this one all the way down to the toe buster. Lock it in. Take this one down. And take this one down. Okay, now we'll loosen our clutch. And you can see it's now, it's not wanting to, it's not wanting to fall. See that? Now, there, there are ways to geek this out completely. <laughs> and I'm, 
I'm kind of indebted to um, Kriv uh, out there in Japan. Um, big shout out to Kriv. Um, yeah, he, uh, he actually found a, uh, a way to do this uh, with a clamp meter. And uh, it's, it's kind of ingenious, um, a little extra geeky, um, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, a little extra geeky is not a problem. Um, but a clamp meter, um, my, my voltmeter happens to be a clamp meter. Um, what you can do is on the power for the mount, all right, this is a 12 volt, 12 volt power supply. I have actually a couple of these, all right, this is the main one uh, that threads into the mount and goes down to the power supply. Right? What you can do is on these cables, um, there are, there's a, uh, um, a hot and a, uh, um, a common, right? And you can separate the cabling out, right? And just separate it apart. And then you take your clamp meter, which is like this. Clamp meter looks like this. Okay. And you, around one of the wires, not both of them, it won't work on both of them. You have, can only have to go around one of them. You, you pull that around on one and you set it for amps, right? Um, the small setting for amps. And then you run the telescope um, with the, uh, um, uh, your, your, your uh, control pad, right? The, uh, the control pad that comes to the scope. And you can move uh, the scope um, backwards and forwards, and you can get a reading as to the amps that it's pulling, right, going one way or the other. And if you're pulling the same amount of amps um, going one way and the other, then you know it's balanced. Now, there's also um, a uh, there's also a, a school of thought that says you don't want to be perfectly uh, balanced. Uh, the perfect balance um, it it uh, can't it can necessarily be a, um, uh, not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so what, you, what, what a lot of people will do is what's called uh, right heavy, right, uh, or east heavy, right? So what you want to do is have uh, the scope um, be just a little bit heavy uh, as it's moving to the east, as it's, you know, because the mesh on the gears, uh, it's, not a, it's not a perfect tight mesh. As a matter of fact, you don't want it to be a perfect tight mesh. Um, because then you'll bind, uh, and it, it'll do, it'll chatter and stutter, and it's not good. So there's a little bit of slop in the gear mesh, just a little bit of slop in that gear mesh, and that slop, um, it where where it moves, uh, the gears move from one side of the gear to the other like that, is what's called backlash. Right. Um, so with with the the scope um, heavy on the east side, right. So if it's pointing north. Um, east is going to be to the right, okay, uh, right hand, east heavy, right? So it will, you, you want it to be just a little heavy on this side, just a little bit, ever so slightly. Um, just, it, it's, it's just a feather touch amount, just enough to keep that gear um, so that it's pushing against the gear. So there's, it, it doesn't have a lot of slop in it as it's pulling the scope back this way. It's, it's pushing against that gear, right? Um, and it, it's just, it's a fine tuning uh, aspect. Um, I, for myself, with this, with this setup as it is, uh, I, I've noticed um, a little bit of chatter in the right ascension uh, with the guiding. And I think that's probably because I need to be a little bit more uh, on the heavy side, east heavy, east side heavy. Um, and uh, next time we get set up, we'll do that. We'll set it up and slide those uh, weights up just a little bit, just a little, ever so slightly, so that the, the, the scope itself is just a hair slightly heavier than the weight end. Right. Other than that, um, the scope is, is pretty much set up the way that you would expect it for um, uh, observing. Right. Um, your front corrector plate is of course available um, and we'll get into in another video we'll get into uh, the setup for uh, running the hyperstar uh, from the front of the scope and setting that up um, pulling the, the secondary mirror out 
threading the hyperstar on with the camera, um, but I probably will not do that until I get the dew shield uh, from AstraZap. Um, once we get that dew shield, then we'll, we'll go ahead and, and mess with that because I know I want to be imaging from the front of the scope. There's some targets up there that I definitely want to get. So, um, other than that, I think uh, we're just about there. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what other things we can be uh, showing you at this point. Um, our power cord, uh, as I said, the Celestron one is nice. It's got a little threaded um, knob on it there that allows you to thread that in there so that it won't accidentally disconnect itself. Um, and I find that uh, running the power directly from the mount uh, instead of coming out of the Eagle, for me at any rate, it works much better. Um, so I have, I have two power connections, one coming from the Eagle, which controls everything up here, okay? Literally everything up here. Um, and the only cables that come off of the OTA are this power cable and the, the cable for the mount. That's it. There's only two cables that come off of this. Everything else is contained up on the OTA. That's really nice because the likelihood of snagging something isn't very good. And these cables, especially like the, the one coming from the, um, uh, the, the, the Eagle 3, is nice and long. So I just leave that, I plug that into my, uh, into my battery, and I, I just leave it go, all right? And I maybe root it through uh, the handle, you know, just to kind of dedicate it down. But I haven't, there, there's been absolutely no problem with uh, snagging or anything. Um, and of course, the one coming off of the, uh, the mount won't snag. There's nothing there to snag. Um, you do want to make sure that the serial port cable that you have coming down to your CGXL from your computer um, down to the down to the mount is long enough, all right? Because the the scope will move to its limits. It will it will come down to its limits, and you want to make sure that you have enough of this cord, right, going down to the mount, so that it won't it won't snag. So I went ahead and bought a six foot cord. That seemed to be plenty. Um, I have a little bit of extra wrapped up at the top, but that, that's, you know, not very much at all. Um, other than that, I think that uh, this is, it gives you a good idea as to what it is involved in getting this set up. Now, I can tell you that I can get this thing, if I'm not explaining what I'm doing, you know, I can get this thing set up from bags out of my car, out of my Jeep, and out of my trailer, and get it set up on a dark sky site in less than 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. Um, it is very easy uh, to get this set up. There is no reason why um, a scope like this uh, has to stay in an observatory. Not, to, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. There's certainly nothing wrong with putting this into a dedicated observatory up here. But if you're going to a, a remote location, um, this kind of setup is it's very possible and you can do it. So um, that being said, um, I guess that's probably it. If there are any questions, if you have any questions or you want to, um, uh, you know, comment on, on what we've done as far as setup here, I know this is another long video. I promise <laughs> the, the videos coming, you know, later are not going to be nearly as long. Um, the next one will probably be uh, with the Hyperstar. Um, that one won't be nearly as long. Um, but I wanted to go through the initial welcome, uh, the initial uh, setup, uh, as to what we're doing, talk about the rigs specifically, uh, and then from this point on, it's going to be about the adventure of getting out and, and setting up either uh, either from my driveway, um, you know, which is perfectly fine, Bortal 5, 4, Skies, um, or doing remote work. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to taking this to remote locations. Um, and setting it up, and I know it's hard to see. But, you know, you can't really see the feet, but this this whole setup, as I said before, sets on a scope buggy, which will allow you to uh, manipulate this relatively easily. Um, it is not hard at all, and I'm I'm looking into a way to uh, actually uh, clamp the um, the telescope, the the tripod legs on the telescope to the, the scope buggy, clamping it directly on there so there's no way that it could possibly come off of, its, off of that scope buggy mount. Um, and that's looking very favorable, actually. I think I've found a way to do that. So other than that, 
feel free to, if, if this kind of content, this kind of video content is exciting to you, if you enjoy uh, this kind of, uh, what, what we're doing, you have questions for us, um, uh, possibly, uh, you know, you want to uh, subscribe to our channel, uh, we will have more videos coming forthwith. Uh, so please feel free to uh, hit that notification bell because we do have videos uh, that will be, um, uh, you know, coming um, soon. Uh, and that, that notification bell will alert you as to when those uh, are, are up and running. Uh, but for now, uh, from Astro Playground, um, I bid you a very fine and wonderful farewell. Uh, until the next time we meet, clear skies. I'm wishing you both health and good fortune. Bye for now.